Howdy, and welcome to session 2E at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Diana Morganti. I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of the STEM librarians at Texas A&M University. Um, and I'm also a member of the TCDL Planning Committee. I'm pleased to be the session moderator today. First, a little housekeeping. Hopefully this all sounds very familiar to you all by now. Um, Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everybody that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everybody here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and your fellow participants. I've provided the link to our full code of conduct on tdl.org inside the chat. The session will run until approximately 3.50. Please feel free to take breaks as you need. I invite you to say hello in chat if you have not already and let us know where you're joining from. You're welcome to share resources and make comments throughout today's session. I will be watching for your questions in chat and I will share them with our speakers during the Q&A portion at the end. And now on with the show. I'm pleased to introduce our first presentation, Using Wikidata to Enhance Discovery for Dissertations, Authors, and Faculty Advisors in Texas A&M University's Mechanical Engineering Department from presenter Jeanette Ho, Scholarly Communications Librarian, Texas A&M University. Jeanette, I will hand things over to you now to get started. Okay, actually, um, I'm like the cat a cataloging metadata librarian at Texas A&M University. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, so today Charity and I are going to be talking about a project uh, done at Texas A&M University where we used Wikidata to enhance discovery to um, dissertations, authors, and faculty advisors in our mechanical engineering department. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with Wikidata. Um, it's a free linked open data platform um, that anybody can contribute to um, or reuse the data. So basically, it's a, dis a collection of descriptions of different entities it can include people, places, things, and works, but um, has other ent types of entities as well. And each one is called an item. So here's an example of an item for a person so, who is in our mechanical engineering department. So you can see uh, Waruna has a, a collection of statements or triples. So you can see she has he, it's, he has a property called instance of human, sex or gender male, languages spoken, written or signed English, and so on. So the Wikidata pilot is an initiative of the Program for Cooperative Cataloging. And uh, for those of you not familiar with it, it's an international cooperative effort aimed at expanding access to library collections. And it does this by overseeing programs um, that um, maintain standards and practices for its members to contribute high quality metadata to be shared globally. And it does this through its WorldCat database. So this, the metadata includes bibliographic metadata for works held in libraries, but it can also include authority. It also includes authority data about people, organizations, places, and topics. So the pilot ran from September 2020 through December 2021, and it fulfilled two of the strategic directions uh, from the TCC. Uh, one was to help its members um, learn about linked data, and another. Um, strategic objective was to accelerate the movement towards ubiquitous identifier creation. So the idea was to get us to move beyond our traditional practice of um, relying on unique text strings for names like Smith John, followed by his birth and death dates, and to get us to rely more on uh, identifiers in the form of URIs and to get our data to be more usable within a linked data environment. So at Texas A&M, we joined the pilot when it first got started. Uh, before that, we had been involved with a different pilot at the PCC where we learned how to create ISNIs. Um, the, the, these, these identifiers are meant to be useful within linked data, but unfortunately we were not able to utilize them as such at the time since they were not ready um, in that way. So the PCC Wikidata pilot provided us with a ready-made platform where we could just get our hands dirty at the outset, which is, um, was really um, exciting for us. So our team consisted of four librarians from the metadata management unit, as well as one curator from the Cushing Memorial Library. And these were not, by no means, this was not everybody in, from these departments, just the ones who volunteered. 
um, to prepare for this pilot, we enrolled in a Wikidata Institute course in the fall of 2020, and where we, we, were expo we were introduced to the platform as well as various tools. And then we attended monthly meetings for PCC participants in the pilot, as well as um, subscribe to its listserv. And so this is a, a screenshot of our project page. So you can look at it afterwards. Um, but right now, I'm going to turn it over to Charity, who will talk about our goals for our project at Texas A&M. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, as you can see on our Wiki Data project page, um, it does list our aim. Of course, the very first one is just to become familiar with Wikidata, uh, but also to kind of get in there and get used to the process of creating Wikidata items um, and compare it to authority control. And then to create items for the, the people, the, dissert, the dissertation titles, and any related entities in Wikidata that may not have identities established for them. And to explore the process and see how we could do um, upload a lot of this mechanically and utilize metadata we already had available through our repository and Vivo. Um, we wanted to demonstrate linked data and we did experiment with Wikidata's uh, Sparkle query service to explore the relationships to see how Wikidata was going to work for the users. And finally, we wanted to expose the information about our collections to a wider audience. Next slide, please. Uh, to do this, we had we decided we had to decide on a collection. So we went with our current electronic theses and dissertations. As you can see, there's a lot of different titles in there. We decided to focus on mechanical engineering, but only doctoral dissertations. Uh, that gave us 576. Next slide. From there, we narrowed it down a bit more and focused on the top 71 faculty members that um, were the most frequent advisors and their doctoral students had ORCID numbers because we wanted to explore that aspect of linked data. This resulted in 217 doctoral students and their dissertations in addition to the 71 faculty me uh, members. Next, please. Uh, so our method was a work in progress. The first thing we did was we extracted metadata from Oak Trust RD Space Repository, and then we batch uploaded it into Wikidata. But first, we utilized Open Refine to reconcile the items and see what actually needed new ones. Then we uh, brought in more additional information for our faculty members, those 71 advisors, through the Vivo database, which is at scholars.tamu. Um, we got this by requesting our uh, DI staff download that information. Then we took that information, uh, ran it through OpenRefine, did the reconciliation process, and put it into uh, Wikidata. Finally, we uh, did some enhancement of the authority uh, records for these advisors by adding the Wikidata identifier to the national authority file, i.e. the authority file in OCLC, Library of Congress, and then taking that LC identifier and linking it back to the Wikidata item. Next, please. So as I said, the first part was importing and reconciling the data from Oak Trust Repository. I'm, I'm not going to show you the you know, the Excel spreadsheet that we downloaded. But what we did is we took that, we cleaned it up a little bit, and we uploaded that into OpenRefine. And we made sure we had the Wikidata extension on there. Next. And then we went through the process of reconciling the data from the Oak Trust repository. Uh, as the record showed earlier, you know, we had to specify like these are human beings. Uh, then we reconcile that data by uh, going to each um, column, going down to reconciling, reconciling to start reconciliation, and it would go through, and if there was already a record in Wikidata, it would turn blue, and we could double check and make sure it was the right person. Otherwise, it would create a new one. Next. So from there, after we reconciled, we... Uh, brought in a schema for the faculty advisors so that we had consistent metadata throughout all 71 advisors. Uh, at, here you can see this is taking that information, those top level um, tags, and putting them in the, the Wikidata record. Next. 
and you know, thesis, uh, the fact that they're researchers, that they're in College Station, ex et cetera, what their degree is in, go on. Uh, then, so that was for the 71 advisors. This is for the doctoral students. We did uh, taking that same batch of metadata from Oak Trust, we were able to create a schema for the doctoral students, again, specifying that who their advisor is. Here's where the ORCID ID comes in. We have, so we put in that identifier as well, uh, what their major was, where they were educated at, the fact they're human. Next. Uh, you know, what they got their degree in um, and who granted that degree. Next. Uh, then we created the third part, the, the third part of the items which were going to be for the dissertation titles themselves. This one was a lot more straightforward. You know, it's a dissertation um, where you can find it. So it'll link back to uh, our Oak Trust repository uh, when it was created, uh, when it was submitted, et cetera. And, you know, the fact that it's part of our ETD collection in Oak Trust, uh, what language it was, where, where we're located, the date of publication, usual stuff you would expect on a record. So finally, the, the last step was to link the dissertation title to the, do, to the student who created it. And that's what this schema uh, does. It's a very simple, straightforward. Here's the thesis title, here's the creator, and that, create, that closed that uh, linked data loop. Uh, finally, one of the last things we did was to go outside of Wikidata. We put the Wikidata URI in the authority record, which is in here is the 024 field. And then we go ahead and take the LC number for it and put it in the Wikidata item, thus working with that linked data again. Next, please. So uh, that was just taking the information from Oak Trust. We got a lot of metadata from there. Then we got metadata from the Vivo uh, database scholars at Tamu. This is an example of the data that was exported from Bevo for this one faculty member, uh, what his degree name uh, degree was in, where it was from, it, what year he got it, his position, etc. Next, please. Um, then we take that data and uh, run it through Open Refine. Everything that's blue there means that there is already an item and we can and it will focus on updating that information in Wikidata because the blue means that there's already an item level thing in Wikidata for it. Next, please. Uh, then the step in Open Refine, we again create the schema that will add this additional information to the already existing faculty advisor items we'd already created. Um, and this is really enhancing their records, which it tells us that you know where uh, the different schools they were educated at, their majors, um, the degree, uh, what time they were there. Next, please. Um, it goes down. Uh, what department they are here at Texas A&M University, and then that pretty much did a really wonderful enhanced records in Wikidata. I'm going to turn it over to back to Jeanette to go over using mix and, mix and match. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a different tool that we used. Um, after we populated Wikidata with all these items, um, we had some extra information left over from Bevo, such as awards, fellowships, and endowed professorships. Um, they weren't core at the beginning, but according to our application profile, but we thought they might be useful to add later. So we wanted to make sure these were in Wikidata first before we used OpenRefine to um, link them up with their advisors. So the tool we use for this is called mix and match. So this is an alternative way to reconcile entities um, with what is in Wikidata. And if they're not there, it can also automatically generate new items. So we created a spreadsheet based on the information we got from Bevo for awards. And uh, we, we batch imported it into the tool. And uh, here's the way the results looked. Uh, but when we were about half, we done reconciling the awards. So we've got things that are fully matched and things that are unmatched. 
So if you click on unmatched, you can see all the words that were not found in Wikidata. But you can see it has various links for us to search Wikidata as well as the various Wikipedias. So if we found one great, we can upset the queue. But if not, uh, we would click on a button saying new item. And this would automatically generate a, a skeletal record based that had the properties that we specified in that spreadsheet that we batch loaded into, the, into mix and match. Um, once they were there, we would do some research and then manually enhance the rec items for the awards based on information we can find about them on the web. Um, then we used, once they were all there, we used Open Refine to batch, uh, to reconcile them and then batch link the items, to, the awards to the items for the professors who won them. Um, and we would qualify this by the year that the awards were conferred. So we did this for awards and we're in the process of doing the same thing for professorships as well as fellowships from Vivo. And another thing we did is that for a subset of the advisors and the graduate students, we manually enhanced them. So we looked at their LinkedIn page, their faculty web pages to see what other things we could add. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but just gives, this gives you an idea of the kinds of information that we were um, enhancing. And again, this was just for a subset of them. We also started to experiment with Sparkle queries um, using the Wikidata query service. So here's one that we did to find out what places hired these students um, once they graduated from Texas A&M. So we could um, visualize them in various ways within this uh, querying service. So you can see there's very little overlap among the places that hired them um, other than A&M. Uh, here's a different a visualization for a different query that we did about the number of times um, each award was won um, among our sample. So you can see there's some awards that were won more often than others. Uh, this just gives you a visualization of the timeline. So you can see there are various spikes within various decades where more a, a greater number of awards was won in our sample than others. And if you could, and uh, Wikidata makes it easy to switch back to the tabular view. So if you wanted to see what was going on, you could examine the numbers within that decade. Um, as for outcomes, I think we have increased the potential for discovery in that at the outset, 62% of our advisors were not in Wikidata and slightly over half were not um, in the National Authority file. So now they're in both places and um, as Charity demonstrated earlier, um, they're a link together. Also, almost none of the doctoral students had authority records at the beginning, but now at least they have a link data presence on Wikidata. And I would say that we've met our goal in that our to make our data more visible on the open web because our data is starting to show up in various tools like Scolia, for example. You can see a timeline with the data that we provided, uh, where what degrees they won, when, um, and at what institutions, as well as when they won certain awards. You can look at a cloud to see the what students they advised, as well as um, see what the dissertations were for these students. And, um, they show you their major and what the department they're from. And EntaTree is another tool where our data is starting to show up. So that's the tool is often used for family trees and genealogy, but it can also be used to see doctoral students and advisors as well as awards. So it's the same information, just a different way of visualizing it. And uh, I would say that um, what we've learned is that almost all the properties we designated as core, as core at the beginning um, could be semi-automated in this fashion. However, there are a lot more that could be manually added that could not be automated. So a question left to explore is what role will Wikidata item play in our work going forward? Um, what properties should be recorded for what purposes? And does it make sense for us to duplicate our work um, in the authority as for authority control, does it make more sense for us to put some information on Wikidata uh, versus instead of the national authority file and vice versa? And does it make sense for more of some people um, than others for different collections? And so our next steps is that we want to continue learning about Sparkle. So we'll probably continue to experiment way, explore ways that this data can be useful. And also we want to share the results of our project within the libraries and um, more broadly. So if you have any questions about our project, you can get in touch with any of us at these email addresses. Okay, I guess. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to both Jeanette and Charity and your two other co-authors. This is a reminder that we will do Q&A at the end for both presentations. As the presenters are switching out their screen sharing, David, please go ahead and get yours started. Um, I'll introduce the speaker for the next presentation. 
responding to faculty interest in rapid publishing during the pandemic, the role of interoperable scholarly communication systems at Texas A&M with another of my TAMU colleagues, presenter David Lowe, digital collections management librarian, Texas A&M University. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, everyone. I hope uh, everyone can hear me and see everything. That'll be great. Yeah. So uh, as Diana mentioned, my name is David Lowe. Uh, title is Digital Collections Management Librarian. And I uh, currently work in the Office of Scholarly Communication here at Texas A&M Libraries. <clears throat> so I'll be speaking on behalf of our whole SCALCOM team, including Sarah Potvin, DJ Lee, and our director, Bruce Herbert. Our topic, as you can see from the title slide, is responding to faculty interest in rapid publishing during the pandemic, the role of interoperable scholarly communication systems at Texas A&M. So the work I will describe today is essentially what we were awarded the TDL SCALCOM award for this morning, uh, for which we're very grateful, but it also included our essential metadata partner, uh, Jeanette Ho, and actually others, uh, Charity, and uh, we could name people in uh, our IT department as uh, Charity and Jeanette, we're calling DI, Digital Initiatives, we call it here at Texas A&M um, Libraries. But anyway, we're, uh, uh, I didn't know we were going to get nominated, but we're very grateful for the recognition, and uh, I'm happy to give you details on uh, the reason for this award in the coming moments. <clears throat> so, let's see, let's go slide. There it goes. So here's a quick overview of this talk. First, we should clarify our terms and parse the coming barrage of acronyms and related entities for you. Second, we'll go into a bit of detail on the tools and their interoperability mentioned in this talk's title. Third, we'll discuss some critical events from the past couple of years and our relevant responses to them. Fourth, I'll connect the tools and responses to an approach or set of workflows really for our services. Fifth, I have, I have screenshots of some of the results of that approach. And finally, I'll highlight some selected use cases. <clears throat> and since I think I have a little bit of time uh, because this is actually a short talk, I would note that I uh, this is the first time I've used this introductory slide, but it occurs to me that it might be useful uh, in an EDI context if you look at lane five there. Um, so might be interested in that in the future, just to sneak an EDI reference in there. All right, so clarifying terms. <clears throat> Our specialized terms really revolve mostly around function components. Uh, like many university libraries, we hold critical files, which could be articles, books, dissertations, posters, conference presentations, teaching materials, et cetera in our institutional repository, which I may refer to as the IR. And at a and we're using version six of the 20 year old, but still very common and very serviceable software DSpace, which we have branded as OakTrust locally. We also use a REM system or research information system known as Vivo referred to in the last talk as well, which we have branded as scholars at TAMU. And you might catch me calling it just scholars. The third piece is the software for metrics from social and other media, dubbed alternative metrics or alt metrics for short. And we use the product alt metric singular from digital science, and we have not branded it differently. So on to interoperability with these tools. First, here's a quick look at the homepage for scholars at TAMU. As you see noted on the slide, we acknowledge some early feedback toward improved user experience from a focus group in our College of Medicine. And here's a bit more detail with logos for the systems we have at AM. So DSpace and also Fedora as repositories. Fedora is not actually connected in this interoperability um, that I'm describing in this talk, but we do use it for other things as you may have seen in. James Creel's Sage talk earlier. Um, these utilize linked data technologies like the identifiers DOI and uh, Handle for digital objects and ORCID for people. Um, then uh, the Vivo software for faculty profiles 
and altmetric for the more immediate new type of metrics that are faster turnaround than the traditional citation. Together, they all enable a social interoperability, maybe interoperable sometimes, but interoperability, as discussed in this work by OCLC's Brian Lavoie and Rebecca Bryant. In brief, we are enabling better collaborations among researchers and clear communication and understanding with department heads, deans, marketing, grants officers, the office of the VP for research and other upper level administrators. So how has this panned out over the past couple of years? If we think about what has been front and center on our minds as academics in this time period with the pandemic, social movements like Black Lives Matter and the attention to making teaching and learning work in a remote or distanced environment, we've had a lot to deal with. Our responses included new collections in the IR and from there, greater interoperability with scholars. <clears throat> Here is a screenshot of the Oak Trust homepage with three collections circled that are relevant to this talk. First, we have had self-deposit enabled for faculty research for many years. Next, about six years ago, the OACs collection received from an a and affiliated author its first openly available textbook or OER, that is Open Educational Resource. And then about two years ago, I created the self-deposit set for faculty teaching materials to hold more supplemental curricular material and other materials with a teaching focus. <clears throat> so how do we approach getting all this to work together? Well, let's note that Scholars works to establish and enhance faculty digital identity and reputation through discovery as an initial step, and then metrics as a sort of summative function. It enables data reuse across campus and serves to provide research intelligence that can be put to use for a variety of reports. In fact, a team-based challenge run by our Data Science Institute this past semester relied uh, heavily on data sets from scholars as part of their creative analysis and visualization competition with great results. And you also heard in the last talk uh, about the Wikidata connection. <clears throat> Here's a depiction of the basic workflow from the IR to scholars for materials like articles or conference papers. Uh, Symplectic Elements, which is also a digital science software product, it harvests new items that it finds to have been added to DSpace. Those go into a database in the middle there and get suggested to faculty below, matched by their names in scholars profiles. And they are able to accept or reject them as their work, similar to the way that Google Scholar and similar profile ag aggregators do, if you're familiar with that process. The accepted items then get added to the public profile of, the, of that relevant individual faculty member and scholars. Similarly, for theses and dissertations authored by our graduate students, our faculty who serve as committee chairs for these students also get their names from the DSpace metadata matched to be claimed or rejected for their scholars profiles. So what are the results of these workflows in real life on the public pages of scholars? Well, I'm glad you asked. First, here is the thesis and dissertation harvest result. Here we see under the tab works by students, some of Bruce's uh, students' works, citations below there. Under the tab denoted as publications, there in the middle, this screenshot features a subsection containing works harvested from the IR, Institutional Repository doc Documents. And as a final example from scholars, <clears throat> here is an example of content under the teaching tab. Below the list of recent courses taught, there follows a list of that faculty member's entries from the teaching materials collection in Oak Trust. So in the concluding section of this talk, I will mention a few use case successes that show how we met challenges during the pandemic. 
Fairly early in the shift to 100% online teaching in 2020, a group of engineering faculty <clears throat> compiled a survey and, and shared its results related to that seismic shift in teaching and learning roles. The altmetric badge down here at the bottom on the left <clears throat> that you see uh, has this label one and uh, it indicates social media mentions as opposed to the DSpace uh, usage statistics accessible to the right of the label number two. Another faculty member from the communication department studied how church-related activities were affected by the move to online services. She was able to publicize her work rapidly and openly using the IR, and we like to point out that such public scholarship is true to the land-grant mission of our university. Note in the altmetric badge that <clears throat> her work has not only been tweeted many times, but has been picked up by news outlets, and is already referenced in a Wikipedia page. And here is a tweet from that very productive faculty member about a more recent book she has published in Oak Trust. She says she's launching her fifth and she's done more since then. So incredibly productive and a great way to get things out there. Finally, a couple more of her tweets about her work in the IR celebrating 1,200 downloads and an invitation from the Vatican to discuss her research. Although we can't promise everyone an invitation to the Vatican, we are pleased to support her public scholarship and its impact. So with that, I will close. Feel free to check out the scholars code there linked on the right side of the, uh, this slide. And you are welcome to contact one or all of us at the email addresses on the left. And I thank you for your attention. I was hoping for an invitation to the Vatican myself. Can't make everybody happy. <laughs> thank you to David and your co-authors, DJ, Sarah, and Bruce. I will now open us up for questions on both presentations. Please feel free to raise your hand, unmute, or type your question in chat. And I'll give us a moment while we wait for that to, to roll in. I have a couple myself, I can get us started. Um, oh good, there's a couple coming in. Uh, I will, I'll hold mine off to go to the attendees questions first. Um, somebody asks, regarding the first presentations, were there certain data sets you used in mix and match? Yes. Um... A month, it was the it was based on the data that our we got our digital initiatives unit to download us download download from it for us from vivo uh so that was the scholars um at tmu database that david was presenting about so we had we asked that they download the data for different faculty members in our sample and uh one of the one of the things, one of the data elements that were included were the awards that they had won, as well as um, different fellowships and professorships that they had. So we were able to take that and um, develop a spreadsheet based on that information. I'd also like to say that uh, that much of that information in scholars does come from the faculty members' curriculum beta. If I recall correctly. Someone also asked for folks new to Wikidata, what is the best starting place? <laughs> yeah, that's a, actually a good <laughs> question. Um, we, we were introduced to most of it for, through the Wikidata Institute course that we took. But um, if you go to the Wikidata site itself, it has a page, I think, that I think it has things for, for people who are just getting started. 
um, if I could share my screen for a minute. Please feel free. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm at the Wikidata website right now. So if you go to the left side, they have something called Community Portal. And on the right side, they have um, Getting Started. So you can see an introduction to Wikidata as well as a glossary, a tour, um, various, various things. List of properties, policies and guidelines, tools. So they're, they're, they have pages where you can get started. Um, I have to say though, that a lot of the tool, tools, a lot of the things that we used, we kind of learned from other sources. Um, like I mentioned that we subscribe we've attended monthly meetings for that PCZ Wikidata pilot. So that was a place where we also gathered more sources as well as from the course that we took. Another thing, another thing is, is that um, the LD4 community also has a Wikidata affinity group. So that was also another source where we got um, information about sources to get started from. But what we did was we compiled all of it onto an internal website that we have within Microsoft Teams. So we have a special channel for a project there. And so that might be something we might want to translate into something where we can share more broadly in the future, I guess. But that's what we found, we found helpful. I'm really into like logistics and project management. So that's stuff that I'm really interested in learning. Um, but also that project page that you showed on one of your slides, I wonder if you um, could share that. Sure. It is available on Wikidata. Um, and one thing to be aware of, you know, we're looking at Wikidata as a, to help deal with name disambiguation, um, identifiers, uh, but it is like, you know, Wiki, Wikipedia, it, it, anybody can go in there and contribute items, edit items, um, as long as they register, um, so that does cause us a bit of concern in terms of going forward because misinformation can be there. Um, but we're very confident in what we uploaded. Yeah, and I've just shared the URL to our project page. I, I haven't heard that. Okay, sorry. I'm just reading. Go ahead. I, I was just going to read the question out loud. Go ahead. Okay, I saw a question. Somebody asked, can Wikidata pages be locked like Wikipedia articles in case of vandalism? I haven't heard that they can. Um, from what I understand, anybody can make any change they want to to any page within Wikidata. I don't, I don't know about project pages, though, so that's a good question, but I've not heard that of any case where people can. And there was also that follow-up question. Um, I assume your dissertation authors don't have a biography that is submitted on um, an ORCID? Um, I, I'm sorry, Jeanette, go ahead. Yeah. I, in your ORCID, um, a profile that you set up, people can submit a lot of things that they would typically put on their CV. Um, I don't think they have, I've seen any case where they have a biography on them though. Charity, uh, you're gonna say something. Uh, I was just gonna say that uh, for this project, we weren't focusing so much on ORCID or trying to enhance any ORCID IDs. Uh, and the information we were getting was directly from the ETD collection in DSpace. So uh, generally speaking, those are not, there's not that kind of biographical information, but um, with some of the tools that Jeanette was showing at the end, you can actually come up, you can actually do some searches and get some, quite some interesting information on people. Okay, yeah, somebody uh, has um, yeah. added to the chat saying, yes, they, they can be, protected. And go ahead, Misu Kim. Hi, I have additional question about Wikidata project. So looks like um, the electronic thesis and dissertations, 
the data exists in Dublin Core in this space. And I think your team exported that and edited on open define, define in batch to add wiki identifier. Um, my question is how you are able to do in batch on open define. Uh, I think Chris Charity showed us some screenshot on schema. Is it kind of your locally customized the schema? Yes, we created that schema based on the Dublin core elements that were in our in our repository. So you are able to add uh, wiki element on, on open define? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I'm not familiar with the uh, open define, so it's hard to imagine for me to how it is possible. But it's a great, very a great presentation. I, it was really impressive. Yeah, base open refine actually makes it easy. Um, once you up uploaded your spreadsheet onto into open refine, um, one of the slides charity was showing had a drop. Each column has a drop down menu that says to start reconciling. So as long as you installed the extension for Wikidata onto Open Refine, you can you can have that feature. So all I have to do is just right do the click on your column, choose um, start reconciling, and it'll it'll find matches for you on Wikidata. Yeah. Um, to be honest, once we uh, got into the automation of it, we pretty much did all of our work in Open Refine. It was only those elements that we were adding manually that we were actually working in Wikidata. Okay. And that was kind of like, you know, bonus information. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was gonna expand on that ORCID question and actually pivot to David. Um, so you showed that workflow on how you get things from the IR, from DSpace into um, scholars, but does it harvest items from anywhere other than DSpace, like through ORCID or um, DOAGE or PubMed or um, any other kind of open access publishing platforms? Uh, yes, I'm not a symplectic elements expert, but that's the tool that's doing that stuff. And, uh, it's, it's not just from DSpace. Elliot, go ahead. I actually have a question kind of following up on, on yours, Diana, um, David, and, and I, I'm sorry if you don't know the answer to this, um, but I was curious when you were talking about um, the items that are being imported to scholars from DSpace that the faculty members have to approve them. Is that right? Kind of manually um, say whether they wanted to add to their profile? Um, so our magicians on the floor above me, our IT folks, we call it DI, have a, I believe it's a PHP, app that does some sort of fuzzy matching of names and so if it sees something new in dspace for which the name looks like something in a name in scholars it is presented to uh the faculty member for approval onto their profile right okay cool thank you um yeah, i was i was kind of curious about how much faculty members engage with that, whether they sort of proactively approve those things, whether it takes, you know, a librarian kind of prompting them to review those, just sort of how that, how, how much they engage in that, I guess. That would be, I would point you to DJ for uh, the details on that, but uh, we do know that I think it's over 80% of Texas A&M faculty have logged in at least once to their scholars profile. So we 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 have currently <laughs> we have respect for the tool. We are moving to uh, Interfolio 
uh, run by not the libraries, but um, for our evaluation process on, I mean, campus wide, not just the libraries. And uh, I am not sure how that will disrupt the attention that scholars gets in the future, but um, um, it, it, scholars is highly respected. Uh, it's uh, on campus. Yeah, it's uh, they they've done a great job, and uh, Bruce and DJ and Ethel, the the scholars team in the scholarly communication office here, have done a fantastic job marketing it and outreaching, going to new faculty. Uh, we just went to a, a faculty presentation last week to uh, help people sort of work on their their uh, profiles and such, and um, it's. Um, it's not just a, eh, I'll, I'll get to it uh, when I can for, for, uh, for some people it may be like that, but um, it's, um, it's a recognized thing that um, uh, people, fa faculty use scholars. So this might even be a related question to that. Um, and I'm curious how, Jeanette Charity, how you all chose mechanical engineering to start? I mean, I think it, the reason I wonder if it's related is, was there some outreach to them where they said, we really want to help increase our impact. And so we'd like to partner with you on this. Like, how did you all choose mechanical engineering? Um, that was a... Um, Basically, we I down I extracted the metadata from the entire collection, and that's where you saw the over twenty thousand titles. There, uh, we took a look at it um, in terms of what department, what area had kind of the numbers and the qualifications we wanted in terms of the number of their graduate students, uh, the thesis titles, um, the dissertation titles associated with it, and really how many faculty um, were advisors, uh, you know, how many were listed as the primary advisor. So it was really less about, oh, well, we really like engineering um, or anything like that. It was really more of which department had the numbers that you know were significant enough that we could get good data but also not so messy in a lot of ways so uh that's really it, it really wasn't any particular one we we did talk about other schools uh, i mean and uh look at other departments we were we were really not focused on any particular discipline that was just uh, you know, looking at engineering and then within the, you know, College of Engineering, uh, mechanical engineering just um, had a number of under 71 advisors or under 100 advisors that actually had significant number of graduate students. Uh, most faculty don't have quite as many as those 71 did. So it, it was just a numbers game. Well, as an engineering librarian, if you want to take this show on the road to engineering, I would love that. <laughs> because they might like to hear it. it. Love it. I, think, I think they would really, uh, I'm, because I'm willing to bet a lot of them are not aware of the fact that their information's now out there in Wikidata. Well, and like you said, in one of your slides, it's something that can help increase impact. Yes. Yes. You know, I think it would be a good idea to kind of run, show them their pages and run them by them just to make sure that they're okay with everything that's on there. Yeah. And we'll take out anything they're not comfortable with. Yeah. Um, I, jumping on to what Jeanette just said, we did have discussions about um, things like gender, you know, identifying gender. Um, and we decided not to do that because we're aware of the fact that um, in some other cultures that can be could very uh, messy for them. So we didn't want to put anything on there that might jeopardize that person. Well, we ended up um, on some of them they had, we did not automate it, but on some of them we had them if we could find references or evidence mm -hmm. that um, certain pronouns were being used. Yeah. So. But we took that out of the core data, I guess is what I should right. have said. I apologize. 
yeah, we did. We couldn't have automated that anyway. Yeah. But um, we were told by some of our colleagues when we first told them about this project that that's something they would be interested in learning about, like how many were female, how many were, you know, just to yeah. kind of know what the breakdown of the department was. Yeah. Well, I think that question took us to the end of our time. So I want to thank all of our speakers today and your co-authors who are in the audience or weren't able to join us. I appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. I look forward to seeing you at other TCDL sessions. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Diana.